in the mechanical engineering from Caltech in 2006 and 2010, respectively. He is currently an um, assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science here at our state. Uh, her research spans several areas of computer science, control and optimization, including formal methods, motion planning, situational reasoning, hybrid system, and distribution distributed control systems. Most of her work uh, draws the inspiration from uh, practical applications, especially in uh, autonomy, ro uh, autonomy, robotics, and transportation. A segment in the portion of her career has been devoted to the development of uh, autonomous vehicles, both in academia and industry settings. In particular, she was the principal research scientist, scientific scientist and led the planning team on the uh, motion where her work focused on planning, decision making, control behavior, specification, and validation of autonomous vehicles. I uh, think so today uh, she will talk about establishing correctness of learning enabled autonomous systems. Now, please. Thank you, Haile, for the for the intro, especially the, the attempt to, to pronounce my name. Uh, uh, that, that was really good, actually. Um, so today I'll talk about generally what, what I will talk about will apply to general autonomous systems, but uh, I'll use autonomous vehicle as a concrete examples. Uh, these are some of the vehicles I have worked on. Um, uh, the focus uh, will be on the correctness aspect uh, of, of these systems. So let me, let me start by uh, briefly going through uh, the journey of autonomous vehicles, especially the, the part that I've been involved in. Uh, first, I would say that a major milestone that really attracts significant research attention and, and, and spur rapid progress in this area is a series of uh, grand challenges that, that DAPA organized. Uh, they were in 2004, 2005, and 2007. Uh, here is a video of a Caltech vehicle. Uh, this is uh, the vehicle named Alice, uh, and this is at the 2007 uh, DAPA Urban Challenge. Um, the vehicle was actually built within the 18-month uh, time frame, which was quite short um, for, for any new technological development, especially uh, because many most of the teams uh, consist mainly of students uh, who also had to worry about classes and exams. So the effort was mainly directed towards putting together and extending existing approaches uh, rather than inventing radically new ones. Uh, perhaps uh, a key exception uh, to this statement was the Velodyne sensor, uh, which was used by five out of the six teams that actually finished the race. And it was one of the essential technology emerging from, from the challenge. Uh, the, the, the LIDAR, the spinning LIDAR and also its successors um, uh, became a key component of many autonomous vehicles nowadays. Um, the reason I, I mentioned this time frame is to show how easy it is to really get a car to drive itself. Uh, I would say if you have like five to six people with sufficient expertise, uh, it's not impossible to convert a normal car to an AV within a month or so and get it to the point where it can actually handle most uh, nominal scenarios. The problem is that the number of off nominal cases, uh, as well as their complexity, may have been underappreciated. And um, uh, this is the, the second set of uh, AVs uh, that, that I was involved in, in building. Uh, this was built as part of the Singapore MIT Alliance uh, project uh, and target urban mobility applications. Uh, and as you can see, they already look quite nicer and cleaner than, than the, 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 the vehicle uh, right here. Um, and uh, we, we had the world first with, with this project, we had the world first public trial of AV taxi in, in, in Chinese gardens in Singapore, uh, where anyone in the public can book an autonomous ride. Um, and this year 2014 is also sort of the, the beginning of the hype of the AV industry. Uh, and this was primarily, I would say, driven by several technological advances that were not sufficiently mature at the time of urban challenge. 
the most notable one uh, being deep learning, which has become a core part of most state of the art uh, object classification and intent prediction algorithms. Uh, some company even went further and, and adopt end to end learning that directly maps raw sensor data to vehicle actuation commands. Um, so this last picture uh, is a vehicle uh, built by a company called uh, Newtonomy, uh, which was later acquired by Aptiv and recently formed a joint venture with Hyundai and became motional. Uh, we also, uh, with that vehicle, we, we conducted uh, the world uh, first, uh, sorry, uh, let me see, the world first public trial of AV taxis on public road in, in uh, 2016. And this is uh, this video show how the vehicle performs. Uh, this whole ride uh, I want to mention is completely autonomous. Um, and the reason I, I brought up this video, not because it, 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 there are many uh, uh, like heavy traffic or anything, actually the traffic is light, but I want to show that even with light traffic, there are already many tricky scenarios uh, that the car has to handle and even have to break some of the traffic rules to be able to, to handle them effectively. Uh, let me skip a little bit because here's uh, the red light, so we just keep stopping. Uh, so it's not very interested and interesting. Uh, so here, for example, uh, we need to do uh, uh, unprotected writer. So in Singapore, we drove on the left-hand side and uh, uh, the uh, turning right is harder than turning left. Um, coming up, uh, you will see uh, a vehicle uh, that actually cut in front of our car, even though we are on the major road. So we had to, to slow down to, to let it go and not, not collide with it. Uh, we also had to handle a stop line uh, at the junction. Uh, the next one after this junction is, is a very interesting scenario. So uh, this truck uh, illegally parked here and it blocked the view of the AV. Uh, and there's even an oncoming car that initially we couldn't see. All right, and, and we need to, to figure out how to keep moving uh, even though uh, the, the lane line next to us does not prohibit us to, to cross the lane. And here is the construction right in the middle of the intersection uh, that we also uh, have to go around and essentially uh, get out of the lane in the middle of the intersection, which is by law uh, not legal, right? So even in this pretty light uh, traffic, uh, 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 we, we already encounter so many interesting uh, scenarios and, and it is not even clear what, what is the, the, the right thing to do with the vehicle is doing it right. Sometimes it, uh, in, in a construction, you see that uh, when a construction worker walk towards the car, the car slow down a little, right? Uh, to be cautious that uh, the, the, the worker might cross in front of it. Uh, so it's not clear whether that's, that's the right thing to do or not. Uh, some people might say that it's too conservative. All right, so uh, this is the video. This whole ride uh, was about 15 minutes. So we, we speed up the video a little. So, uh, the, so that's sort of the, the, the journey of autonomous vehicles. Um, now, when you work on AV, autonomous vehicle, one of the biggest questions uh, that you will have is how do, we, how, how do we ensure that these systems are safe and more generally correct? Uh, a common approach that has been proved successful for ensuring correctness of software system is formal methods, uh, which have also been applied to cyber physical systems that involve interactions between computing and physical components. And uh, this slide sort of summarizes different formalisms uh, to automatically generate a system that is ensured to be correct by construction. Uh, and by correctness here, I mean that a mathematical description of the system satisfy its specification. And here, uh, specification formalizes all the requirements, which in the case of autonomous vehicle have to include safety, laws, ethics, local culture, uh, pretty much everything, right? So that, that, that form the, the requirements uh, for the car. And uh, different formalisms that I listed here, closed system, probabilistic, and reactive, uh, they deal with different types of systems, like uh, deterministic system, probabilistic system, and non-deterministic systems. And also, they sort of offer different types of guarantee for example, in closed system synthesis, we basically just want to make sure that the system satisfies the spec. 
Uh, in probabilistic synthesis, uh, the objective is to maximize the probability that the system satisfies the specification. And uh, on the other hand, in reactive synthesis, we want to make sure that the system satisfies the spec regardless of what the environment would do. So environment in, in autonomous vehicle case include all the other vehicles, pedestrians, agents, traffic light, all around it. Uh, we have to ensure that whatever they do, uh, the spec has to satisfy. Now, uh, one of the biggest problem with formal methods uh, especially in when applying to autonomous uh, system domain is in actually in its very fundamental assumption that we know how to map uh, a state to the property that uh, the state satisfies. Uh, this, this mapping uh, is called uh, the labeling function. Um, what, what this really means is that, uh, for example, in, in autonomous driving, uh, the, the actual X, Y position of the car doesn't really matter. What really matter is whether the car is within a lane, whether it is colliding with anyone and, and, and so on. So these are the properties that we actually care about rather than the actual uh, X, Y position. And, and the labeling function will map uh, the X, Y position to these properties. And, um, uh, it, it, it might not uh, be, be clear to you right now why this is so hard, uh, but I'll give you a, a concrete example uh, that it's not always the case that this labeling function can be easily defined. All right, but this is the very fundamental assumption. Uh, you can see that from, from, this, uh, from this book, Principle of Model Shaking, it show up as definition 2.1. So it's the very first definition in the book, right? And I already claim that uh, you know, we, we, we don't have this element. So this is a concrete example I'll, I'll give you. Uh, it is regarding how to correctly turn on the turn indicator, so that the turn signal uh, in, in the car. Uh, I, interestingly, I found that one of the, 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 the trickiest problem, <laughs> even though it, it seems simple for human, getting it right is, is not uh, trivial, especially people expect much more from autonomous vehicle that has to do the right thing all the time. So they pay much more attention to, to what it might do wrong, right? So, um, uh, we did get in touch with uh, an authority to, to clarify how to correctly turn on uh, the turn signal. And, and these are the three uh, detail uh, uh, requirements that they gave us. The first one said that the indicator should be activated after the previous turn has been passed. All right. Now the question is, what, what does the previous turn really mean? Right. Let's say I am here, I start from here. Right, and I plan to go straight through this junction and then turn left at this junction. Right, uh, is this junction considered the previous turn to my turn? Uh, so what it means is whether the the previous turn I only count the turn I would make, uh, or it also count the turn I could have made. Right, and and if it's the turn I could have made, what? really prevent me, right? Is it only the physical uh, road or it also uh, uh, include some, some logical barrier like the lane I am in, for example. And, and, and in other requirements, there are also the terms that are not very clear as well. Like we need to activate the indicator three seconds before initiating a turn, right? The, the problem is that uh, we have continuous trajectory. So where along this continuous trajectory is consider uh, initiating a turn uh, for us, right? And where, where, where would the three seconds before that mean? And, and same thing for the last one, the turn is made where along continuous trajectory is the turn considered made. All right, so this is one of the trickiest problem, right? Ter term formalization. How do we mathematically describe this uh, uh, very ambiguous English words? The second challenge is that uh, I'll show in, in, in this video uh, is that uh, is in, in, in some scenario, we cannot always satisfy all the rules. Right. Uh, for example, if we encounter an Ill illegally parked car uh, next to a solid lane boundary, uh, in this case, we are not supposed to, to cross the, the lane line. Uh, but the rule also said we need to give sufficient clearance uh, to the parked car. Right. So as you can see in the video, there are sort of two extremes of what we could do. One is we satisfy the lane rule, like in, in this uh, scenario. Right. So we try to squeeze in, but that means we would violate the clearance rule. And the first run that you saw was when we 
uh, satisfy the clearance, but then violate the lane boundaries. The question is, which one is correct? And there's also a lot of you know, behaviors uh, between these two uh, extremes, right? Yeah, so the question is, uh, which behavior is correct? And I think different people will have different answers uh, to this. All right, so acknowledging that uh, uh, we cannot satisfy all the requirements all the time. Uh, we recently proposed a framework called minimum violation uh, planning. It's another uh, synthesis uh, framework. So in this case, instead of ensuring that all the requirements are satisfied, uh, we attempt to minimize the amount of violation or what we call here the level of unsafety. And uh, so here we essentially acknowledge that rules are not equally important. Uh, for example, if we have to swerve to avoid hitting a person, we should do that even if we have to violate the rule about turning on the turn signal three seconds before the turn. All right. So we, we order the rules uh, into the hierarchy and then use the lexicographical ordering to compare the level of unsafety of the trajectories. Uh, this is appear in, in, in the paper that, that we recently published in, in, in the ACC uh, uh, this year. And uh, we also propose sort of a generalization of minimum violation planning, and this is called the rule books uh, framework. Uh, so in this framework, uh, we, uh, we define a realization as a world trajectory. Uh, so this trajectory includes the evolution of states of everything that, that, that is relevant. Uh, so including our own states and the state of all the relevant agents like pedestrians, other cars, traffic light, uh, construction, uh, everything, right? And then a rule is defined as a function on realizations and it measures the degree of violation of any given realization. Um, and finally, a rule book is a pre-order set of rules. Um, and this means that rule A and B uh, can be one of the following. Uh, the first case is that one is more important, strictly more important than the other. Uh, so you would be happily violate, in this case, rule B, uh, to save even a tiny amount uh, of violation of rule A. All right, so this means A is strictly uh, more important than B. Uh, the second case is where uh, the two rules are incomparable. All right, and then uh, the, the, the last one is that they are of the same rank. In this case, you might wait, put some weight between the violations of the, of the two rules. Um, so with the rule books framework, uh, it allows partial specification as a base for distinct jurisdictions. For example, we may have a base rule book. So let's go back to our uh, park car avoidance example. Right? In this case, uh, there are sort of four relevant rules. We don't want collision to happen. We also need to keep uh, sufficient clearance. We want to stay within the lane and we want to minimize the park length. Right. And let's say there are sort of four different possible trajectories. Right? Trajectory A would uh, collide with the, with the park car. Uh, B would give very small um, clearance, but then allow us to stay within lane. Uh, C is where um, uh, we violate the lane, uh, viol uh, lane uh, keeping specification, uh, but then have sufficient clearance. And D is where we violate uh, the lane specification even more, all right? So uh, we might have a base rule book that say, okay, between clearance and lane keeping, uh, they, they are not comparable. So it depends on different cities, how people, uh, how different people like to drive. Right? So in this case, we could refine these rule books in two different ways. Uh, one way is where we make uh, the clearance more important the lane keeping, right? So in this case, uh, we would prefer to, to, to give sufficient clearance uh, to, um, to, to the object. And then on the other hand, we could also refine the rule in a way that lane keeping is more important, right? In that case, uh, trajectory B will be preferred over C, right? So as you can see here, once we have a rule book, uh, it also induced an order on the trajectory as well. And we can tell uh, which trajectory is more preferred than, 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 than others. All right. Um, okay. So uh, example of, of how we could uh, implement this uh, rule books. Right? So one example is liability aware planning. Uh, so we may have 
So let's say there's this hypothetical uh, example, right? Where this is our car, right? We are driving and then there are sort of two cars approaching us um, uh, on different lanes. So here we sort of have two options. Uh, we could, so we will break uh, as hard as possible, but even with that, we might not be able to avoid collision, right? So uh, one option is that we keep going straight, right? Still break as hard as we can and collide with this car. Uh, another option is that we swerve, right? By swerving, we gain more distance. Uh, that means we could slow down more. We will hit this car at a lower speed than hitting this car, but that means we will be at fault because we swerve to hit the other one. All right, so uh, if we really care uh, about collision at fault and we say that uh, no collision at fault is more important than no collision, then we would take the green path. All right, but if all collisions are treated equally and we only care about the impact, then uh, we would pick uh, the swerving path. All right, so that's 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 how we uh, specify uh, the correctness through the, the rule books framework. And it allow us to uh, precisely describe or, or compare uh, trajectories in a non-ambiguous way. Um, and, 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 and Singapore sort of adopt uh, this, this uh, notion. Uh, they, they start to acknowledge that, all right, uh, there are a lot of traffic rules and it is now quite obvious that not all the time, all the rules can be satisfied. So in Singapore, they, they started uh, what they call the technical references, uh, which will become the, the, the standard. And it, it also encoded this idea of minimum violation planning and, and, and rule books. Um, and they have very detailed uh, mathematical uh, uh, explanation of, of what is the right thing to do, all right? How much gap exactly you, you should take. So it's much more detailed than a typical driving manual that, that, that human usually read. Okay, so now because it's, it's still unclear uh, how we uh, should break the rule in the correct way. Uh, so, so we start a project that we call reasonable crowd. Uh, so the project acknowledged that the vehicles have to balance a complex set of objectives like driving safely and comfortably, we need to comply with uh, numerous traffic laws, getting to the destination and meet all the ethical and cultural expectation uh, of reasonable driving behavior. And uh, preferences of driving uh, really vary across different humans. Right, so uh, there is really no consensus on a driving behavior specification that balances all these considerations. And there is no standard framework for this kind of specification. Uh, so we created a, a data set consist consisting of annotators preference between two ways of navigating the same traffic situation. And we use this data set to compare and contrast the rule books approach with uh, a bunch of uh, machine learning methods. Right, so this is the kind of screen we show to the annotator. So we show the video uh, of the eco vehicle traversing exactly the same scenario in two different ways, uh, like, like in this screenshot. All right, and we ask them to pick whether uh, which one is more reasonable, right? Is a reasonable, is a reasonable driver will most likely act as in A or in B. All right, so, uh, and, and despite all the qualifications that we require for the annotator, like they need to have more than uh, uh, 20,000 miles of driving experience in North America and pass some certain tests. Uh, the annotations can be very noisy, showing that there's not really any objective best way to drive. Right? So different annotators will prefer uh, different ways to drive in, in, in these scenarios. Um, these are some examples of uh, scenarios that we study. For example, scenario A showed a trade-off between uh, the left and the right uh, vehicle clearance. So this is, this is our car here. We sort of stay too close to the right lane. Here we stay too close to the left lane. And uh, the question is, uh, <laughs> which one is better? Right? So as you can see, it's, it's not very clear. Uh, now, scenario B, it might be hard to, 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 to see, uh, but this showed a trade-off uh, of a vulnerable road users, like collision with a pedestrian. So there's a pedestrian standing right here, right? Uh, in this, uh, the, the, the left uh, case is where the car would swerve uh, to hit the, the car on the next lane to avoid the pedestrian. Or uh, it would just continue still applying the brake, but hit pedestrian rather than swerving and hit the other uh, car. All right, so there will be all these uh, uh, tricky cases that the annotators have to pick which one they think is more reasonable. 
So uh, in this case, we, we consider rule books with 14 rules. So it, it is shown uh, here. And this is also, it also showed uh, the hierarchy between the rules. Uh, as you can see, no collision with the vulnerable road user is, is at the top uh, of the hierarchy. And uh, we also augment the rule book with the decision trees for the case where rules are not comparable, like uh, R4 and R5. All right, and, and we compare the rule book uh, plus decision tree approach uh, with other run, learning based uh, approach. All right, so from, from SVM, neural networks, random forest, uh, uh, Bayesian networks, uh, uh, linear SVM and, 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 and so on. All right, uh, and we use uh, classification accuracy as our main metric to measure the performance. Uh, here, the result actually show that the rule book plus decision tree, which, which is this last uh, bar, um, um, is performing actually quite well. I mean, it's not the best, but it's still uh, in, 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 in the acceptable range. And the nice thing is that it is the most interpretable model uh, with the pre-order priority structure. It makes it easy to explain why the vehicle would choose to do whatever it, 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 it did. And, and what do we learn from here, right? First of all, the data could also inform improvements to individual rules uh, and also the hierarchy in the rule book as well. For example, it could help to calibrate some of the uh, free parameters in the rule. Uh, the data could also help determine uh, what important rules are missing. Uh, for example, we identify comfort and crosswalk related rules as necessary to specify the desired driving behaviors. Okay, so I talked a lot already about um, the system level specification, right? What, what is correct as the system overhaul, overall? Now, typically autonomous systems are quite complex and, and, and consist of several components. And, and uh, for example, this is, this is a typical uh, architecture of autonomous systems. Uh, so starting from the world, right? Uh, we, uh, the, the vehicle will have a bunch of sensors that perceive the world. Uh, after that, it goes into perception uh, that try to uh, compute the, the representation of the world uh, around the vehicle. Uh, it send that representation of the world to the planning and control component, which will then uh, issue the, uh, the, the actuation command to the physical vehicle, right? and which will then affect the world. Right? So this is, uh, I would say that perception and planning control, these are like a big key component in, in, in the vehicles. And um, the problem is that these different components, they use different performance criteria and specification language. So let me uh, start with the physical component, right? We, we usually uh, specify or describe or model it with, with the differential equation, x dot equal f of x and u, all right? The world may be specified using ODD, operational uh, driving domain. Um, and sensors use different kinds of uh, specification like the range, field of view, resolution, and so on. Um, perception, on the other hand, uh, often uh, uh, use uh, performance metrics like accuracy, precision, and recall uh, to measure the performance. And uh, we may use formal specification in, in planning and control. Uh, the, the question is that from all these different uh, specification uh, languages. How do we derive the, the system level specification? All right. Um, so to, to answer this question, we first focus on the perception and the planning control component. So here we acknowledge that formally specifying a perceptual task is pretty much infeasible, right? It's not realistic to be able to mathematically describe what pixels should look like to be able to be able to, to be identified as a human. On the other hand, people in perception typically evaluate their system based on performance criteria like uh, accuracy, precision, and recall already. Right. So the question is, how do we, from this uh, performance criteria, how do we evaluate uh, the, the the system? Um, um, uh, so in, in, in this work, we, we try to, to, to answer this question. For example, given a confusion matrix, right? Um, uh, and, and, and also a deterministic controller, uh, initial state, how do we compute the probability that the system satisfies the specification? 
All right, so uh, let me uh, go through an example to describe uh, how, how we would solve this. Let's say this is, this is our AV uh, and on the side of the road, there is a, a person here, right? Um, so uh, obviously perception component will not have 100% accuracy to, to identify that you know, this object is, is a person. So we, we focus on this classification uh, accuracy problem. And so uh, we start with system level specification, like, you know, if, uh, the, if the pedestrian is not here, then the car should not stop. Uh, if the person is here, then the car has to stop uh, right before the, the person. And it should not stop anywhere else at all. All right, so we start with a confusion matrix, right? And what we do from that is that we will use the confusion matrix and the formal specification of the controller uh, to build a Markov chain that describe the system evolution um, based on the controller and also the confusion metrics. Once we get this Markov chain, then we can run probabilistic model checking to compute the probability that uh, this system specification is satisfied. All right. Um, and one of the interesting thing, I mean, we, we might expect this already is that uh, so in, in, in machine learning, we know that there is precision and recall trade-off, right? It's, it's almost impossible to improve both precision and recall at the same time. Typically, when one goes up, uh, one would go down. And uh, it's not very clear what would be the, the right operating point, right? What, what, what is the right precision and recall trade-off that, that we should uh, operate at? Uh, so in this case, you, you can see that uh, when the recall is high, so that's the purple plot. Um, and the true environment is the pedestrian, we have higher chance of satisfying the spec. But at the same time, if the environment is anything besides pedestrian, we have lower chance of satisfying the spec if we try to optimize the recall, right? So uh, this will tell you the exact number of uh, what is the probability uh, that the overall system will satisfy the spec given a uh, certain number of precision and recall. This is something that, that you know, we were not able to, to answer before. And typically people pick uh, this operating point at, 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 at almost random, all right? Uh, and typically they would try to maximize the recall, right, for, for the safety purpose. But, but that might not always be uh, the, the best thing to do. Now, um, so that was the case where the controller takes the most likely uh, classes of object. Uh, but in more sophisticated system, a controller may also take into account class probabilities uh, that the perception report, right? Uh, so the problem with class probability is that in, in machine learning, we often treat the output of the softmax layer of CNN as probabilities of object classes, even though Strictly speaking, this is not correct. Uh, this softmax layer, they just report a number from zero to one, uh, and then they sum up to one in the way that uh, the higher the number, uh, it, it indicates more confidence, right? But it does not have any like real uh, strict sense of probabilities. Like all this sigma algebra is not really well defined in this case. So uh, the question is that how can we evaluate how good these probabilities estimates are because we know that they cannot be exactly correct, right? Um, there are actually some existing measures in literature like BS uh, or ECE uh, score, but uh, they only tell us the overall uncertainty of the model performance. Uh, autonomous systems, however, needs to pay more attention to some specific classes like pedestrians, uh, vehicles. So uh, we, uh, introduce a new uh, metrics. So essentially here, what we do is that we, we sample uh, multiple subsets of our test data, and then we compute the prediction errors. Right? So in each of the subset uh, from the probability of the class, we know what's the expected number of that class we are expecting in, in this uh, test subset. All right, and then uh, we, uh, compute the difference between the actual number that we have, right? And, and, and this will give sort of the errors. And uh, so we, we 
uh, run some experiments with uh, multiple uh, data sets. So one of them is the Cypha 10 data set. Uh, here on, 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 on this data set, uh, we can see, and, and we, we use two different uh, uh, models, uh, CNN and ResNet. And here we can see that based on accuracy, uh, 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 classification accuracy, uh, uh, ResNet actually perform better than CNN. Uh, and the BS score is also consistent with the accuracy. So here, the lower the score, the better. Um, and our approach uh, show that uh, ResNet, so this is, this is uh, the plot that show the result of our approach. Uh, here is the mean, and this is the variance. Uh, and it shows that ResNet classification in most categories are better than CNN. However, CNN has lower uncertainty uh, than the ResNet especially for classification result of class three. All right, so here CNN is the blue and ResNet is the red, right? So you can see that in for all the other classes, uh, CNN has more uncertainty, but uh, for class three, uh, uh, CNN is actually better. And this is even though the correct classification result of class three uh, is smaller for CNN than ResNet, right? So for specific class, accuracy for CNN is worse, but when we look at uh, how accurate is the probability estimate? The CNN actually performed better for this specific class. Um, so essentially what it means is that even a model has lower accuracy than other model, it's still possible that it is more confident about the output probability than the other model for some specific classes. Okay, so I think that's already quite heavy. Let, let me uh, summarize uh, this talk with, with this picture, which I think summarized the talk very well. Uh, this is about how to draw uh, an owl. Um, so the first step, you draw a circle, you draw two circles. Second step, you draw the rest of the, of the owl, um, which is very similar, right? When you think about behavior specification, it sounds very easy, right? You just want it to be safe and lawful what this means, uh, you use the second step to figure out, all right? So behavior specification is easy unless it has to be very precise. Okay, so with this, I'll stop and I'll be happy to, to answer any, any questions. Okay, any, any question from audience? Go ahead, Shana. Uh, thanks, Nog. Thanks for the uh, wonderful talk. So uh, I had this one question. In one of your uh, example, I think around slide 10 or 11, you uh, talked about this two laws or rules, the, the lane changing rule and the clearance rule, and where you are essentially like, you know, like hierarchically choosing which one to violate, right? So, uh, So my question is, Considering like, uh, do you, for in scenarios like this, do you also consider the behavior of the, or the dynamics of the obstacle there? Like if the car there was like parked that there is no driver there, essentially, you know, the best decision is to violate the least uh, priority rule, right? But in, on the other hand, if the car just stopped to, you know, let someone out or to, for someone to get into the car, then maybe, you know, you, it's ideal to wait. So do you take into consideration such things in your modeling? That's a very good question. Uh, this is a very good point. So uh, I will say, okay, then let me answer it from the theoretical and the framework point of view, right? So uh, we have the concept of realization, which is the world trajectory. So we need to identify what matters for the vehicle, right? So in, in the case that you mentioned, if we identify that it matters whether there are anyone inside the vehicle, then that knowledge should be captured in the realization as well, all right? And once we capture that, that means when we evaluate uh, which trajectories is better than the other, uh, then that knowledge will be taken into account. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, the framework allow uh, that consideration, uh, whether uh, that knowledge is important or not, uh, whether it matters, uh, I think it's, it's, it is up to different uh, city to, uh, or, or implementation to, to decide. Uh, in, in Singapore, at least, I think the, the suggested clearance of one meter, uh, it is 
uh, regardless of whether there is a person in, in the car at all. It could be because you know you, you try to be more on the safe side, right? From far away, you might not see uh, inside the car. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that was a, a very good question. Any other question? Yeah, I have a question just that when you do this kind of detection of objects in front of the car, what's the main difference between if it's a human being or a car? It should be quite different, right? The car is rigid. So you, the, you know, the person is, whether there is a, in your model, whether you would need to distinguish different type of object. Right. So very good point. So the question is whether we behave differently when we are behind a person or behind a car. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So I, I think this this is up to again the 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 the, the law. Uh, but you can also imagine the case where if a person in front of you is is a, a kid versus an adult, you might already want to behave differently, right? You have to be much more cautious around a kid than, than yeah, an adult. Yeah. And also now if we consider just a person versus a car, right? I, I would say that a car, uh could be slightly more predictable in the sense that we could assume that they would follow some road rules, all right? And, and it has some, some dynamics that the car has to respect. Mm -hmm. A person on the other hand is much more uh, movable, like, you know, we, we could switch direction uh, abruptly, unlike a car, right? So if a car is moving forward, uh, you would think that it would move forward for a little more, right? It couldn't just go backward all of a sudden. This is not the case for a person, right? So at least, uh, uh, knowing the type of the object uh, will, will make us better understand how the object may behave and how can we be more safe around them. Does that yes. answer your question? You, you, you do this through the classification stuff, right? right, right. Can... Oh, okay. okay, I see. Yeah, so uh, let me show, I think it's related to this slide. So uh, in, in oh, yeah, the perception yeah. component, perception. we need to identify the classes and then a uh, planning control will use this knowledge to plan accordingly. Yeah. But you also said that this, this, uh, ResNet is better than CNN or? Well, that, that was just for a certain- uh, For a particular certain, piece, right? Certain uh, data set only. It, it was some uh, random like Saifa 10 uh, data set. Uh, we just want to give an example here of when accuracy of one model is better, but then the, the probability estimate is actually worse. All right. If for, so what that means is that if the controller uses the probability estimate, uh, we need to be careful and we cannot just look at accuracy because they might be irrelevant. Okay, and then a question? Dan, you have a question? Okay. Sure. Uh, I think um, Ido, Ido had a... Had oh, okay, Ido first, Ido first. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, no, great, great, um, great talk, very, very interesting. I think uh, one observation, maybe for, before I ask my question, just one observation for, for Sumik, this sort of uh, highlights uh, probably the needs in, in a center like the track um, for, you know, some sort of ethics competency, I guess, in terms of, um, there are so many ethical questions that these kind of systems uh, raise that we probably need someone, you know, uh, professional ethicist as it were uh, in our center to, to deal with, with such things. And, and I've seen these in, go on in other centers. So just something for, for you to consider as the leader. Of, of yeah, well, uh, we actually do have, oh. you know, socialists and, and uh, who are particularly interested and we have an ethics uh, subtrust uh, AI ethics of trust, uh, you know, precisely to you know, understand this. Is. So, you know, uh, I would point to Sean, Sean Dorius, uh, and but you know, along with him, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cass Dorius, as well as uh, Sri and Ilakanda, who is, I think, online here. I mean, so all these That's people are, are actually interested in understanding the fairness, biases, and ethical uh, concerns around deploying AI systems. So yeah, absolutely great point. And okay. All right, uh, it, yeah, Good. yeah. So um, just from, from another point of view, going back to the um, head-on collision versus sideswipe collision uh, uh, dilemma. Um, so this kind of goes back to some sort of, uh, you might have a rule zero here, like I don't want to die, right? 
So uh, regardless of liability, I would of course choose in that respect to be liable if I were indeed liable, because I think I'm not, a head-on collision forced me to do the side swipe collision. But let's just for argument say, okay, I'd rather go to jail than, than get buried, right? And a side swipe collision is less lethal. So, so these kind of, you know, Asimov style robotics laws might, might come into play here in terms of uh, adding, piling on, um, you know, what is at least, uh, what is, was at least damaging uh, and so on and so forth. But there are so many questions that are open here that I can't even start to uh, discuss them. So this has been really an, an eye opener. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. So uh, in the early days when I worked on uh, autonomous vehicles, every time I give a talk, the question I would get is, what about this, uh, what is it called? The, 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 the problem where you need to decide whether to switch the rail. The uh, trolley problem. Yeah, the trolley problem. The trolley problem, always yeah. Always showing up. And, and I think my, my answer to that would be, I mean, this shouldn't be up to a developer or you know, a, a software engineer to decide, right? a single software engineer to decide. At least uh, you know, the, the, the society should agree on what is correct uh, as, as a whole. And it shouldn't only apply to autonomous vehicles. Right? It should apply to everyone uh, using the road and, and, and make that a uh, consistent um, uh, behavior for, for everyone. Um, but 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 that, that's a you also brought up a very good point. Uh, I think this problem of behavior specification, it, it sort of go beyond the tech, uh, technical challenges, right? As you as you mentioned, it goes into ethical. It involves a lot of uh, regulatory requirements. So uh, it 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 needs a broader group of people than than just engineers or, or, or scientists. Right. So if you tell me what is the right behavior, it will be easy to implement. The, the, the question is nobody could, 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 could sort of you know, specify what is exactly right. Well, the, the trolley problem was set up as an ethical dilemma that is not supposed to be exactly solvable. It, it's supposed to, to uh, generate discussion rather than a solution. Uh, your, your goal here is to generate solutions. Um, so I'm not sure that the, I mean, the trolley problem is an interesting uh, problem to say, well, you can't really solve this because it doesn't have a solution. It's, it's kind of raising a, a discussion on, on, you know, how ethical you are by action or inaction, right? Right. Um, so so I, I agree with you that it is not, uh, you know, the objective best solution, but I yeah. think at least uh, people should agree on, I mean, not, not agree, meaning like everyone think that one is better than the other, but we should put in as part of the law that, you know, the, the, the thing that you are expected to do is this, right? And it might be different for different cities as well. Uh, it shouldn't be up to like, you know, different uh, software engineer to implement different behaviors based on his own opinion on, you know, which behavior is better. Well, it absolutely should not be left up to software engineers. Very little should. <laughs> <laughs> And, and another, when it gets to autonomous uh, system, it gets even more complicated, right? Because of the uncertainties in perception. Now you don't have things about, oh, if you go straight, you will hit, if you swerve, you'll hit another group. Now you have something like, if you go straight, you hit with certain probabilities. If you swerve, you hit with another probabilities, right? What is the right uh, thing to do? <laughs> you probably yeah, have to- up, upload a new module as you drive through different states and cities, depending on their laws, right? That would be interesting. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, this discussion is a little bit related to one of the points I was just going to mention is that this all reminds me a little bit of some work that goes on in sports analytics, where like in basketball, for instance, you there's cameras and they know the precise location of the ball and all the players on the court and the referees. And, and you have like, you can, you can calculate or there are methods for estimating the expected point value at any moment in time. And then the way they evaluate decisions that players make is if they're making decisions that increase, you know, like if you're the point guard and you're, you're dribbling the ball and you do something, you know, you try to do something that increases the expected value, right? And so, you know, that's weighing the probability of various outcomes and it, it but you have to have some, you have to have a clear objective and here is to score points it's less clear in your problems, right? The objective is to get somewhere, but to do it safely and to avoid all these problems. And so yep. it's, it's more complicated, but it reminds me that some of the problems are similar, I think, in those two areas. Um, the question I had is, a, is, a, is just a different one. I just wondered, um, are you aware, are people doing any work for um, 
autonomous vehicle driving in winter conditions. Um, and you know, I, I imagine that would be a, a great challenge uh, given that I've driven in this state for many winters. <laughs> I, I agree. So, um, so I don't know exactly whether there's a specific uh, group uh, working on it. Uh, uh, so some of the things about uh, winter is that, you know, snow could, could, could cause quite a bit of, I mean, it depends a lot on how you train your system also, right? If, because snow, snow bank on the side could look like certain objects, right? And it could cause a lot of misclassification. And also at some extreme temperature, uh, sensors could stop working. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, some of the, the technical challenges. Now, uh, so, and, and I cannot tell exactly whether any companies uh, would uh, uh, try to, to, to solve the problem. Uh, Right now, I think many companies are sort of focusing on what they call the level four autonomy, uh, where, so initially people start with level five, right? So that means you put a car anywhere, it would drive. I think after some point, uh, we start to realize that this is not feasible. And that's why people start to come up with the concept of ODD, right? So it described what, what are the, the conditions at which the, the vehicle could, could drive safely. So that includes also uh, the weather conditions, the type of road, uh, the, the, the geometry of the area, the city it's allowed to drive in. So essentially everything. And, and that's why uh, you know, we, we sort of uh, go more for, for level four, right? So we know that this, with this kind of ODD, we could perform well, and then we try to sort of expand this. Yeah, that's interesting. And I imagine a problem then could be, you know, when do when does your autonomous vehicle not perform, you will not perform autonomously. So like, you know, based on the weather information, you might say today, today, we don't, we don't try, you know, right. and so yeah. that's that in itself is an interesting problem. Yeah. And, and then, and I mean, there's a classic problem that the human uh, computer interaction people worry about is when to transfer authority, right? So when the you know your semi-autonomous car transfers authority to people and then so and, and which is an unsolved problem at this point it's very difficult actually because and most of the tesla crashes right i mean tesla tells you that uh, you gotta be always aware and, and be able to you know grab the wheel whenever it's required but again the car doesn't tell you and and most like i mean in many cases that uh, people are reading harry potter and then that's it and boom and, and didn't have enough time to react right so so that's what actually happened. So this authority, you know, transfer is another classic problem. Even like when you're thinking of semi-autonomous, where human being is still present. So yeah, uh, uh, Ulrike, you had uh, had a question. Yeah, it's not directly. Hi, everybody. It's not directly maybe an uh, artificial intelligence or decision problem. But I'm curious. Your your talk sparked that question. As an architect, I, I I'm always aware that we we see space because we have two eyes, right? The parallax. So how, how do these autonomous vehicles uh, sense distance? Right, right. So and yeah. how, do, how can they be tricked by spatial spaces which are working against the parallax? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. So one thing I want to mention is the vehicles see the world very differently from human. Uh, so some of the sensors that usually uh, are being used by, by, by these vehicles are uh, uh, camera. So camera will be closer, so it, it gives the vision, right? So it's closer to how humans see the world. Uh, but it also relies a lot on LIDAR, which is something that human doesn't use. And LIDAR really is the main source that provides the depth information, right? How far uh, the, the, the object is. Uh, but again, because the LIDAR is not something that, that human rely on, the vehicle could see the world very differently from human. Right? LIDAR could pick up, let's say, fog or uh, rain, and it thought that you know, this could be an obstacle, right? Whereas to, to human eye, rain is purely nothing. Right? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the big questions for the takeover, which Shumik just discussed. When, when do I take over and what is the different sensing of the environment from the human eye versus the car? Right, right, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I thought that, okay, I, I don't have the picture here. I think I usually, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I removed the picture, but uh, the, the cases where, where I, I put in the picture that show uh, how the vehicles see the world. Thank you. 
Very interesting. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, again, yeah, thanks, Nog, for uh, leaving all this time to actually have this very interesting conversation. So uh, I, I, I mean, this is one of the seminars where we had so much, uh, you know, discussion. So I'm really appreciative of that. Um, any other uh, questions from the uh, audience here? Otherwise, uh, we could wrap it up here. And uh, yeah, so it looks like we're good, good to wrap it up here. And then uh, so I we hope that all you all will come back next week for our next, uh, and I will send out the flyer at the beginning of next week as usual. Okay. All right. Thanks, Nak, again. Really appreciate you doing this and uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So